All right, everybody, thanks for coming out on a, what ended up being a terrible Saturday. My <laughs> name's Matt Arian, I'm the Vice President here at Intuit, and uh, it's my honor today to welcome Pierre, who's the director of the Mad Museum, which is a show that he'll be taking us through shortly. So he's going to do uh, an introduction on their museum uh, here for a few minutes, and then take us in and show us some of the individual pieces. So sure, feel free to answer or ask any questions at any time. Thanks. Uh, welcome, and uh, thanks for coming over through the snow. Um, I just wanted to start here with a brief introduction about what the museum is, how we work now, and where we come from, because it, it helps when we talk uh, in the exhibition about the artists to better understand uh, what they are doing in this collection. Um, so, Man Musée is in Liège, and Liège is a city in Belgium near to the German border, to the home border, but almost everything in Belgium is near to a border since it's such a small country. Um, Musée is, uh, as you see in the image, a uh, little bit on that uh, side. It's in a, uh, a building from built in the 60s in a park, a wonderful park in the center of Liège, and it was empty uh, during uh, the late 70s, but it was before a drink hall, which is uh, mainly a, a club where people go or went in the summertime to dance and eat and listen to music in the, this very weird, like UFO uh, shaped kiosk. Um, it was empty, and in the late 70s, an artist uh, from Liège called Luc Boulanger decided to squat it. Um, he went in there together with some uh, disabled, uh, mentally disabled artists with which he worked with, uh, whom he worked with, and he uh, started a workshop there. Uh, first, it was a workshop uh, temporary for uh, one exhibition, but during that exhibition in this building, the mayor of Yesh was there for the opening and said, "Well, you can." You can stay here, you can use this building. We own it and we don't have plans. It's, it's empty, so stay here. And uh, since then, the workshop continued there. He uh, always uh, had this combination of creating a space for the artist to work and uh, accompany them. Yeah, just follow them. Um, and also organizing exhibitions. And in these exhibitions, he invited a lot of different kind of artists. This is a picture from later uh, than what I'm talking about now. But in the picture before, that's more from in the beginning, you see a lot of different kinds of, uh, they did a lot of different kinds of events uh, that had a very funny side sometimes, uh, uh, just creating a show where they only give a title and everyone can bring their work, and so everything was mixed. There were um, well-known professional artists bringing in things, but also uh, yeah, your mother could bring in something, or artists from the studio, and it was all installed all together as one big installation almost. Um, but so exhibiting and the studio, it was always something that went together. Uh, we also, and that we still do, uh, organize music festival uh, in the summer. Uh, <coughs> that, of course, brings a big crowd also around the museum. Um, and it is always, it always has been something that is very much uh, anchored in the network of uh, artists. This is one of the of, of uh, artistic and cultural life in the in the city. This is one of these old. Uh, exhibitions where you see that everything was just put together and it was like one big uh, installation and the party for opening it was part of the whole thing. Um, so that means that these uh, artists that were working there were really part of a, a, a big buzz in the, in the city of too. And that artists from outside were also involved. And this was then the start for a new collection. So there were artist uh, works made in the, in the studio that were in the collection, but also other artists, like here you see a work from an artist from another studio in uh, Belgium, 
uh, and this was from a studio in Brussels, and this was an artist from Korea. Uh, Korea is the name of the of the workshop in Liège where everything started. Um, this was in the in the cell, in the, the basement of the museum, and there were the, the exhibitions um, when the museum really started. So that's also an old picture from the, 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 the exhibition in the basement. But then uh, we had problems with water coming in the basement, and it was not good for the works, as you can imagine. And uh, so we decided to uh, to close down the gallery in the basement and only use the gallery upstairs and start to look for uh, creating a new building for the museum so that we can show our collection permanently, which is not the case now. Uh, in the 90s, uh, beginning of the 90s, the, it was too small. Every, the, the, the studios really needed more space and they moved to another place in Liège, where they are still now, along the river. That's an image of the of the studio. So now, from that from that moment on, the museum really had an autonomous uh, working was a, an autonomous working place, and the studio too. Um, and we work sometimes together, but uh, not more than with any other studio or art artist we ever work with. Here you see one. That's the working space of Pascal Tassini, one of the or important or most important uh, artists in the studio that is also in the collection and here in the exhibition. I'll talk about him when we'll be there, but that's the place where he works. So we do exhibitions uh, with living artists, which means that we don't collect uh, looking in uh, catalogs or looking to uh, other uh, galleries or we collect by organizing exhibitions, inviting artists to do, to make work, uh, or to show they, their work in our gallery. This is Adolf Weitler from, uh, from Germany. I'll show you, uh, I run it. Um, I'll show you uh, an installation that he made for the collection that is here next door, but that's him at the opening of his exhibition. Since he didn't feel really comfortable with openings, he said, well, I just sit down and continue my work. But that was a big installation. This was the show of uh, Pascal Tassini from the I was talking about earlier, with his sculptures and drawings and paintings. And in the back you see the, the head pieces uh, that he's making for marriage. Uh, well for marriage. So that's Pascal uh, in, at the opening of his, uh, of his show. But it, I wanted to, show, to include these pictures to show that uh, the artists themselves are really involved in uh, being shown in, in our museum. The artists individually, but also the studios. So sometimes we invite, uh, we invite the whole studio to create an exhibition together with us uh, in, the, in the museum. And then uh, we, it depends on how they react to this uh, invitation. This is again the Pascal Tassini uh, show. Um, that's the, yeah. I'll come back to the studios when I, with, with other pictures. This was an invitation like we had here to show our collection here in Chicago, but in Paris. Uh, it was four years ago, we had a wonderful space there, which, uh, La Maison de Metallo in, uh, in Paris, and it was for us well, an exceptional moment because we could show, we show off with the, <laughs> with the collection and make a, a very large, uh, uh, selection of it. Where, is, where in Paris is this? Uh, it's uh, Belleville. Oberkampf. Oberkampf. It's the, the metro station. It's a. Uh, it's owned by the city. It's uh, a former uh, working union uh, place, but now turned into uh, 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 exhibition space with concert space downstairs. And uh, we showed the collection there. A big a lot of works from the collection, a big exhibition, and we invited two artists to create a work for that exhibition. And that's what happened with uh, Close Company. He's an artist from a, a workshop in Belgium, and he makes drawings inspired by uh, a lot of things, but mainly by the news. He, he likes to see pictures from the newspaper and to pick them up and to 
laugh with it. He, he, he will always give it a turn, give it a twist, and it becomes something monstrous. And uh, in that case, uh, Barack Obama was visiting Nicolas Sarkozy in Paris in that moment, and he was learning Spanish. So he, uh, because he's also always fascinated by different uh, languages, and uh, so he made a big, big drawing. Uh, he made a small drawing and then we blew it up and made it on the wall where he was uh, saying in Spanish that uh, Barack Obama uh, had sex with Nicolas Sarkozy being in Paris. <laughs> and that, I, I was really lucky that we had no American visitors. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, is, uh, this is a workshop in, in Florence, in Italy. It's Latinaia. Um, Latinaia is an old, uh, one of the older uh, uh, workshops from, uh, in Europe that they exist already a long time and there are quite some artists from Latinaia here in the exhibition uh, but I want I sh this series of pictures is with pictures of us visiting workshops because it's really a big part of our job is to go to see how the workshop evolves how the artists evolve uh, how they are working uh, and trying also, of course, to see if it's interesting to have new pieces in the collection or uh, to organize an exhibition with them or to see. So it's a really relational thing that is ongoing uh, with a lot of workshops we have contacts with. This is uh, in Brussels, Priam Brussels. Priam was started in Liège, but then some other uh, workshops took over the name and, uh, and the way of working, like here in Brussels. It's Daniel Stax, so we have a, a drawing here in the exhibition. I'll uh, remind you of that later on. Later on. This is again in uh, Latinaia, in Italy, and you see that um, we spend a lot of time going through archives in each uh, workshop because they um, most of them are not really equipped like a museum in archiving their work and seeing how to keep it for a long time to know 10 years later who made it and when and why and because since uh, it's a new team with new people so they don't always know what, how, how things uh, evolve and um, <coughs> it's always a pleasure to do that to be there and to discover work um, this is uh, Stephanie, <laughs> and it's uh, in, uh, in another workshop in, uh, in Italy, it's called Blu Camelo in Livorno, and uh, she's holding a, a sketchbook that is here in the exhibition too, of uh, Manuela Sagona. We knew Manuela Sagona before because we had already worked for her, but having this sketchbook is something important for us as a museum, because it's not, you, it, we don't only collect to show the work, but also to archive it or to better understand, have a better understanding of what, what the work is. So in the choices we make, it's not always the same as if you make a choice for, for your own as a personal collector for is it good on my wall or does it fit in my collection and in my uh, choices. It's something where we have to be also consider more objective uh, values about uh, who, who will uh, what will this sketchbook mean for the director in, of the museum in 30 years, which will not be me anyhow. <laughs> so um, that's, that's something we also, and that's also why we do, I try uh, not to do that alone. We, we travel a lot together with Stephanie, that is the uh, uh, collection, uh, which is, she's taking care of the collection, so that we have uh, discussions about it and that we can make the choices. Sometimes that's a lot of work. Um, it's Giga, we also talked about him. It's a guy that makes tons and tons and tons and tons of drawings. So your eyes have to be uh, you know, well uh, trained. This is when I had a beard. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, another studio in Frankfurt in Germany, uh, Atelier Goldstein. Um, it is one of the studios that is uh, very professionally uh, organized. You, be, you can see a lot of differences in the way the studio is organized, the way they work with the, with the, the artists, etc. They are very, um, 
how do you explain? They are very well managed in, in a way that they introduce their artists into uh, the right collections where they want them to be, to be exposed in the place where they want, etc. That's a, and that's very different with some other workshops where they say, oh no, what we do is having the work here with our artists and that's what we do. And if someone from, else, from outside comes and is interested in that, we're happy. That's it. And uh, so that's, it's also something we have to consider is where, where are we going and who are they working. This is also in Goldstein, Hans Georgi. We have a drawing of him, but he has two very different kinds of work. He's making beautiful drawings of the boys, I'll show you there. And also these gigantic uh, scale models of, uh, of uh, uh, airplanes and flying cities. Uh, and he can explain to you what's happening there and there. And that's the, the, it's a very complex uh, thing. And he has a lot of these. Uh, big uh, plates and we'll do a solo exhibition of him with a catalog in two years or three. Again, another workshop uh, without the beard in Italy. Uh, you've got, you will recognize this uh, in the exhibition. Um, also to show that workshops are also very vulnerable. Uh, this is Adriano Michele. Uh, this woman on the right uh, is leading the workshop and uh, they are in a very big uh, old psychiatric hospital in Italy and the management changed. So uh, for them, if the, the management of the psychi psychiatric psychiatric hospital, they are not necessarily really uh, engaged or concerned with art. And for them, it's just taking place uh, taking money for something they can do. If it's just occupation, you can organize it differently. And so they are now uh, in uh, less space and have less time to, to do their work, etc. And they are in a difficult situation because of that. That's, and, and when money uh, starts to be uh, a problem, uh, art is a lot of times the first thing that says, Okay, that's, we don't really need that. But they have incredible artists, so that's a, a, big, a big issue uh, in some of the, of the workshops. And it can, uh, that's also something we, we try to do as a museum, is to give information and to share information about the importance of this kind of work, that it is not just something to occupy your time, it can be more. This is another workshop in Italy, I go a bit through. This is in London, it's um, into art. They don't call themselves a studio, but a collective. It's uh, two uh, artists, uh, Sam and Ella. This is Ella, that um, worked together with. I mean, trained artists working together with a group or of uh, in the beginning five or six uh, um, artists with uh, mental uh, learning disabilities, and this is. Um, I forgot her name. Ngenze. Uh, Ngenze goes there to work and they uh, uh, they are in a complex of, uh, of studios for any artist and they uh, hire a place there. They pay it all together, everyone plays a part and they share the place and they go there to work. And that's why they are called, they call themselves a collective because they are a real artist collective. Uh, and it was really uh, amazing for me to see arrive when I came there to invite them to do an exhibition at our museum, in our museum, how that made a difference in the way uh, I was communicating with them. <coughs> I was directly in contact with the artist, talking about my cho curatorial choices of what I would like to show and why, and uh, dealing with them directly. And that was really good and uh, nice to see that the structure in how studios is, uh, are organized has such a big influence also on how you, you come to work with them. They don't have very much space, so you will see it's rather cracked. <laughs> um, 
And uh, on the right you see this uh, black and charcoal uh, drawings. It's from uh, the Reen McPherson that is in the show now, uh, making in wonderful, uh, very expressive uh, drawings. Um, this is again in with Adolf Beutler in Berlin. And uh, Adolf uh, made this big installation in the museum and we wanted a piece of him in our collection. And they were ready to donate uh, a part of that. But then there was a problem of how, how will we show that work. We cannot show just one, one uh, piece. We have to show it as an installation. So he made an installation on a plinth or, or a pedestal of a certain dimension. We took a picture of it and we reproduce it all, all, always like that. We never show a piece of, the, of this installation. When we invite our studios to do an exhibition uh, in our museum, we also invite the, someone to give a lecture. Uh, this is Tony Maria from Creative Growth in Oakland. And he came uh, when Creative Growth did a, an exhibition in the museum to explain how they work. And that's of big, big uh, importance also for people working in studios in Belgium and uh, around us that through the museum they have access to uh, other ways of working. So, so what I am doing about this, like what I'm doing now, explaining what we do, explaining the work of the artists, like, the, like here in the outside arts fair in New York uh, three years ago. But also just uh, gathering with uh, people working in studios uh, so that they uh, meet each other, so that they can ex exchange uh, how they work, the problems they have sometimes, or uh, the good practices that they, that they are in. And uh, this is also something that we uh, initiate. And then, it, you know, like now in Belgium, we know that uh, through collaborating with another organization, uh, with, uh, we, we managed to, to make this communication go really, really good and it makes it a big deal for them. This is another... And this is a, uh, was a gallery talk that I gave in London for the Doreen McPherson show. You see the, the, the drawings in the back is Doreen's work and I... Uh, I was invited then to, to talk about her work, so uh, that's also something not only for the, for the atelier as a structure to work in, but also for the individual artist. We uh, gather information and we share that as much as possible through this kind of events, but also with the library. We have a, a very good uh, library that is specialized in this kind of work and in outside the art and environments in a broader sense and that we want to continue to see evolve like our collection is. Uh, and uh, next year, in, um, in spring 2015, we'll close the museum to build a new, bigger building on the same spot, uh, including the old one. Um, and we will have more space to, to uh, invite you all to, <laughs> to be there and to see, but also if you want to study in the, the the, the library would become a real study center, and uh, so we are evolving. And this is, of course, a very important step in this uh, evolution. But so I invite you to go in the exhibition. Uh, maybe you have questions before we go there about the museum and the way we work. And otherwise, I can just pick some works and uh, talk about it with you. No questions. Well, I, I just want to, uh, first I have to apologize. Um, I was supposed to be here to introduce Pierre when he started this morning, my name is Randy Thick. Um, and I teach at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and have been very involved um, in the world of these studios where they cross over with my other world, art therapy. And, um, and it took me nearly two hours to get here this morning, so I wasn't here quite <laughs> time for the introduction. But I, the thing I want to underscore about what um, uh, what is very interesting about Met Musee 
and uh, the, the work that you're going to see here is there are many wonderful studios, including a number of wonderful studios here in Chicago, Project Onward, one I'm involved with, with Rod Lentz here at the end of the road, is the director. And we were there on Thursday, looking at work. <coughs> um, but Maguse is unique as far as I know, in terms of having um, this very significant formal, permanent collection of work from many of these studios. Um, many studios may have some small permanent collection of, of their work. It may be called that, it may just be called those things that haven't been sold yet. No. Um, but uh, Mademoiselle has taken this um, umbrella approach to really bring together work from many of the studios. And that's really quite unique. Uh, I know of nothing else in, in Europe or the U.S. quite as extensive. There certainly are um, collections, historical collections, that are freestanding. Um, the um, Prince Horn collection is a psychiatric collection being one of the probably best known ones. Um, but it's unconnected with this idea of where the contemporary artists are working and making. So it's really a, quite a wonderful window into really a cross-section of the very best work that's really being done. This show primarily uh, from Europe, but there's some Americans in there as well, which is a delight to see as well, as, you're, as we'll look at shortly. So. Okay, well, that's good. Cool. <laughs> uh, Open in San Francisco, and um, it was in our collection, uh, very early on. I still don't really know how it came there uh, because it was only one word and normally that's something we never do. Uh, when now an artist enters the collection, we want a representative uh, uh, part of, 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 of his work, in meaning that uh, if he makes, uh, for instance, a sculpture and drawing and there are three different types of drawing, more or less, that he's working on during his, or perhaps been working on during his life, we would like to have a sample of uh, these different aspects of, of the work, so that we can, he can be really represented in the collection. Here it was not the case, there was one very wonderful drawing uh, from a period that then when we studied after what, what, who he was, who he is, um, it seems that it is a work of, the, of a very good uh, period in his uh, career. And uh, so it, for a very long time, has been also a bit of the, the, the image we wanted to show about the, the, the quality of uh, our collection. Um, we had the chance when we were in Paris uh, a few years ago to see that uh, Creative Road started a uh, uh, gallery, uh, Gallery in Paris, and to meet uh, Tom Di Maria there and to talk about this drawing and to say, well, you know, it's a bit strange that we have this so lonely. <laughs> <laughs> so then we, we uh, managed to get uh, smaller drawings, and now we're happy with the way he's represented in the collection because we have different kinds of work. And it was also the start then to invite them to make uh, this group exhibition. And you see there are, you will see other works from the same workshop. That's also mainly how they come into the, music, to the, to the collection. Uh, uh, it's very rare that an artist is coming in alone. Uh, they, they are, most of them are chosen uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this process of visiting uh, workshops, so they come together with other interesting artists of the same workshop. So you basically inherited, this is an example of something you already, it was already collected that you inherited, so you're both really a curator and a, a caretaker of this collection. I'm not sure it's, uh, it's future. So did you did you mention in your introduction how you saw the this show being curated for some of it? Is it a historical cross section? Did you 
thinking about it? Yeah. The no. kind of the people yes. why these works came. We we wanted to to give a cross section of the of the collection to show the, the variety of it, the diversity of the collection. Too. So uh, we don't have uh, one style or one um, taste that we want to put forward. What we want to put forward is that each and every artist that is represented here has his own universe and his own uh, language and his own story and that uh, they are together in our collection but that is because of our history that not necessarily has anything to do with them. Anyway. Uh, and so I just really picked out uh, one work of, of, yeah, of each artist uh, so that we can show as many different voices as possible. So we've all been shown in Mabuse, in, in group or individual exhibits, or some straight from the archive on the walls here? Some straight from the archive, mm -hmm. but uh, like for instance, the Pupit boat there, it's um, when we visit the Vienna Platz in Actually, we visited to the radio because we have a very long relationship with them. Say, uh, you know, we Fritz will have a, a nice exhibition at Internet showing the collection. Uh, we have some pieces of now, but uh, not that good as the ones we see here. And he says, well, you know, if it's going to Chicago, yes. it's <laughs> the moment to, to, to give you a new one that is uh, worth being there. And so then. We donated this piece, but it's the first time it's shown now, ah. and it will be. It's also because we, we we have that prospect of the new building, of a permanent place to show the collection. That's interesting also for them to to know. Well, uh, if we donate this piece now, we're sure that it will be shown, and it's not just uh, dying somewhere in a in a, in a black box. So there's a certain strategy that some of these uh, directors of these studios have. Yes, well, we, we also have to be uh, with arguments to mm -hmm. <laughs> for why why it's we think it would be good, um, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and we we also want to fill uh, sometimes gaps of um, things that we missed in the past, and uh, that we we did we had a wonderful. Uh, when the release uh, show in the museum in the year that Wesley uh, Lewis died. And uh, so he died during the process of creating the exhibition. And uh, so we did a big tribute to Wesley Lewis with uh, in the park, as you saw in the pictures with the concerts. Uh, there were cons concerts of uh, Belgian uh, musicians and uh, band rock bands that covered. Uh, Music from Brazilians, and some of them translated it in French, and <laughs> it's very, very funny. And, and a lot of people in Liège still remember the, that Brazilians moment. And but we have not, nothing; we had nothing in the collection. So now we are uh, filling this uh, gap while we are here to, to try to have, and, uh, and we have now three <coughs> wonderful drawings uh, that will come in the collection. But uh, for some others, like uh, with Hillebats, uh, you have to help me with the name of the, with the hair and the big eyes. Um, the artist, uh, okay, um, the artist, the artist, the artist, the artist, the Royal Benzel. Royal Benzel is uh, a very good uh, Outside artists from Hillplatz. We did a lot of things with Hillplatz, but we never had raw pencils at the time that we had access to it and that it was. But now it would be impossible for us to require a raw pencil. So that's sometimes something we have to do. It and, and, and. But so, to talk about the reverse again, this is, there is also a variety in. Uh, types of artists that sometimes there are, you will like, this is an artist we are not alone to defend or to present. You can see him and his work here at Interwitz, but also quite some like Wood, the Lang, Nancy. And a lot of big collections have um, yeah. Greg McIntosh. 
but Saito Wataru, uh, a Japanese uh, artist, is really only in our collection. Um, it's a Japanese guy that is making this very strange uh, combination of uh, trains and then these strange looking guys that are sometimes in kind of machines and, uh, and in cars and making very uh, complex uh, drawings with these different uh, things on and there is a schedule of him there at the school also. Uh, but so I'm, I'm really, really happy for that, that we don't just want to follow what any other kind of collection is doing, uh, but that we have some overlaps, but also some artists that we really want to present. So that all of the things in your collection are artists who have been working in workshops. I mean, what if you found a wonderful artists who have not had the privilege of working in a workshop. It, it, it's really, like for instance, Willis, for instance, right. didn't yeah. work in a okay. workshop. Okay, or not the New Zealand. Yes, so that the, the, the artists from New Zealand that we have in the collection, they don't okay. work in workshops. It's, um, let's say, 90% or 95% work in workshops. Mm -hmm. but. Um, it's not a limited. I also always say that we, um, we we are determined by the past of the collection, but we make the future of the collection. So there were things that were that changed during that evolution, like uh, the, the the situation of Italian workshops, for instance, uh, made that. We don't only have work, uh, artists with mental disability, but also psychiatry uh, backgrounds, because in Italy they all work together in these workshops. That's very different from how it works in Belgium. And so bringing artists like, uh, um, like Giacomo into the collection, uh, but an Italian artist that lived his whole life in this closed. Uh, uh, psychiatric hospital in um, Italy, and then uh, I think he was in jail. Yeah, they yes. led He was in the psychiatry of a uh, of a psychiatric department of a prison <laughs> his whole life, and then he was free to go, but he didn't want to. <laughs> he wanted to get back because it was too disturbing for him. And he's always making this kind of self-portraits uh -huh. with these closed buildings uh, and sometimes a wound, sometimes the wound is, is in his head or on his uh, cheeks. cheeks together with other like symbolic uh, ways, uh, symbols, like a tree or something like that. But uh, this kind of work would not have been uh, in our collection in the first period, like Luc Boulanger would never collect this because okay. he says, no, that you see it, it's psychiatry, it's something else, we are not in that. And, but uh, in the context with Italian workshops that changed, and so we have some artists from another background. And now for me and for us, the main focus would be to talk about the art uh, and what it, what it is, not and less about uh, if uh, it's someone with a psychiatric background or working in a workshop with and I don't even know about uh, all the medical uh, situations of all the, all the workshops the artists that are here. Well, and these are two worlds that do and can frequently overlap. So mm -hmm. to say this is a pure psychiatric and this is purely developmental is mm -hmm. in itself a problem. Yes, a yeah. problem. Well, so. And and, and is, was, is there, excuse me, is there any directory international of all these workshops that, that are out directory? there? No, well, okay, where you found them? Like, okay. okay, I'm going to Italy, where, where should sure, I go, you know? Can I discuss? Or? I think somebody <laughs> needs to do that. Well, well there, there is, there, there are publications. John Maisel's. Yes. <coughs> 
guy, whether he calls out outsider art guy or something. He has a, yeah, a number of them, mm -hmm. certainly not all of them. And yeah. I think probably, at least in terms of the European ones, maybe the better clearinghouse is that new organization, the mm -hmm. um, European the Outsider Art Association, mm -hmm. which is the members are strongly from the studios, mm -hmm. um, but also curators of galleries and museums and okay. uh, historians and mm -hmm. so forth. It's really, that group is very diverse in terms of distance mm -hmm. and perspectives. But it's also something that we discover, all, always discover right. new, new ones, even, even mm -hmm. when we think that we've been through there, we discover, and like a uh, whole, whole part of Europe is uh, for us to discover still, the, the whole Central European part and Eastern Europe is, uh, is still a mystery for us. So we are really, really looking forward to go to Poland, to go to, uh, to check in and, and all these countries. And there are many small ones um, that are, you know, very low visibility. Right. And, yeah, that's what I'm feeling. Yeah, and, um, you know, the, the, the strategies and the qualities of the work uh, are going to vary widely, just as there are some very high-end art galleries and some very storefronty kind of art galleries. And uh, you go to any art school, and there are some very, very talented people and some quite marginal people. And so this world is, in some ways, no different. What I want to just point out with this uh, artist as well, and uh, but I, I can keep that one in mind. I can do it also with uh, William Scott here. Is that? Um, what, what I found very interesting is that um, there are some um, general cultural uh, backgrounds that, uh, that you recognize also here. I mean, I'm sure that... Uh, Giacomo, that he he doesn't know about Italian surrealism, and he doesn't know about uh, about the Shiriko. And but when you see his drawings and his paintings, you feel like it's this transparency, uh, as like uh, William Scott. He doesn't know about uh, necessarily know about the, the American uh, painters or about uh, Jasper Jones, or but he but you can you can. Almost feel this uh, transparency in, in his in his work, and that's something that I found very funny. Also, when you have the, the, this very orthodox uh, discourse of uh, art good uh, defenders that say that uh, everyone is uh, that this uh, this kind of situation has to be left alone, so that they are, that, that they have no cultural influence. Everyone has cultural influence. Uh, when you decide to take paper and to draw on it, it is, it is already a cultural influence. You're not just taking your finger and put it in the, in the sand or in the snow. So it's, it's um, I think this is a very strange uh, discussion. And uh, I like it to, to see how the artists themselves are just uh, <laughs> well, even if, if it was possible at one time to be so isolated from culture, or, you know, that's the buffet's notion, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's certainly impossible now mm -hmm. in the day when we are so inundated with images through print media, through television, through internet, through, you know, everywhere, images come flying at us nonstop. I'm not sure where you can be in, unless you're in underground bunker with yeah. no electricity that you cannot be influenced by the culture. And it's sort of a ridiculous goal to keep people, human beings, mm -hmm. from from being part of their culture. Yeah. And it's, a, it's almost that's inhumane to think about the lock, that illogical next step. Yeah, that's also the, the fun of uh, working for us, of uh, working in a very contemporary uh, scene that is evolving, like we uh, at Goldstein in Frankfurt, there is now a guy, a very young guy, uh, working there, and they wondered what he was doing because he was making sometimes nice uh, drawings of kind of hip hop uh, style, and uh, but then 
it's, in that, it's strange because it looks like there is something else about that work and uh, until the day that they discovered his computer and the real work is actually his computer. He's uh, autistic and he has this computer full, 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 full of images that he makes uh, in different files and a complete structure of a network of, of different files with different kinds of images that he's making a, a whole construction of that. And so when they discuss that, they, uh, they, uh, they try to put him to see how this can be kind of that of this for his words. And so it's, it's um, so interesting how also the, the setting of a studio where you provide uh, paper and pencil also evolves into something else. And we see more and more uh, also new media uh, being uh, used by uh, younger artists entering the studio. So the computer was filled with images he was collecting as sources, or he was producing images digitally as well? Both. Uh -huh. He was uh, combining images that he produced on the computer together with found footage from the internet and making a whole, uh, I don't know how to say it, but a whole network of links between all these different uh, images. And I don't know that I've ever seen his work in uh, in the flesh, mm -hmm. in, um, but there seemed to be a rectangle underneath each face. Are there like photographs underneath that he's working from, or do you know anything about how he creates his work? Because I, I, you know, you see reproductions and you can't see that little sort of shadow of that edge of his. He, uh, he wants the world to be. Uh, he wants to paint the world like he wants the world to be. Mm -hmm. He grew up in a, in a very poor neighborhood in, uh, in Auckland, and uh, he, he has uh, very wonderful drawings of buildings in that neighborhood that he draws again as brand new as he wants them to be, but he knows that they are uh, they are not, and so he his drawings have something like like the drawings you see when a new project will be built that, that with all rich people on the, on the, on the sidewalk yeah. and nice cars on the, the brand new building and then the, this promise never, never happens. And he goes back to that promise and makes very, very uh, wonderful drawings. And he does the same with uh, the portraits that he's making. This is a family portrait of his family and he calls it family with love. Uh, he's called William Scott, but in the, in the drawing he's called Kevin, because he would have preferred to be called Kevin. <laughs> and they all have this almost uh, scary smile and uh, aggressive happiness on their uh -huh. face. <laughs> they look happier than the Bill Cosby family. Yeah. So and, they, um, and that's why he cut this, is because he wants this to be perfect. And that technically, when you do it again and again, it becomes dirty, and you, you lose the white, and you lose the, the expression. Though, so then he decided to cut a new piece to put it on top and do it again until he has it completely. So he's literally pasting over the imperfections. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. He also has self-portraits as the most social guy in the world. <laughs> Um, yes. This is uh, Marta Brandt. She's from uh, Holland, and uh, she's making a series of uh, watercolor ink uh, drawings of herself in daily life activities. And here she's shopping, uh, but there is another one where she's. Uh, Doctor or dentist, or where she's in a supermarket with a shopping cart, and uh, uh, she has a earpiece and, uh, and glasses and red hair. So you, you can always recognize her in the, her character in the drawings. But they always look also grumpy, and, uh, and it's also sometimes very funny the images that you see 
typical uh, scenes from someone that is living in a, in a home, or I don't know how you call that, it's a group home? Yes, a group home, and where the kitchens are not like the kitchen in your own home. Yeah? <laughs> and, uh, and, or when they have a party for, uh, for an anniversary and they have this small things on the plate that are very detailed. She will make all these details come come up. Yeah. So it's uh, but it's a very uh, same style of every every time. But a different setting. Well, it's interesting to me when I look at something like this. And in, in the moments ago, we were talking about the idea of uh, the influence of culture. The viewer, of course, is influenced by culture too, right? In terms of what we see and how we take the work in. And I can't help but see a sort of Beavis and Butthead style um, uh, animation with those skinny bodies and that over, overly large head and that sort of sneer that they always do. So it's like at what point, at where even the cultural influences are coming from every direction, whether or not she ever saw those works. Um, there is something in the air at the moment, at the time in history, that, that artists are these sort of like antenna for, and they're picking it up in some way and bringing it to the work, even if it's not like, oh, I saw that, and now I'm going to, I'm going to recreate that. But there's just something in the atmosphere. I just want to say something about this work. Then there's one other one, and then I just ask you what you what you would like me to talk about. But, um, this cross is uh, made by Jean Paul Godard. He's working in, in, in Belgium too, uh, but he was not that active in the workshop when he started. He was just more of a very annoying guy that was just always there doing nothing and uh, taking things from another one that is working and. <laughs> So the the the, the, the studio uh, how do you say facilitator. facilitator said, well, uh, Jean-Paul, uh, you have to decide what well, what are you doing here? If you don't want to be here, just go to another workshop somewhere and, and do something else. I mean, you don't have to be here and drink our coffee. With you. Uh, <laughs> so I said, yeah, yes, but I would like to do something. You know? So what are you interested in? And he said, well, God. And then he said, well, do God then, I don't know, do something. And then he started to make these crosses. Um, but he works very, very, very slowly. Uh, he died now a few years ago, but he, he went out to take his pieces of wood, which would already take him a lot of time to, to make that selection, but then uh, assembles them to make crosses. And uh, the, the nails, that he, he, has no, he has very few for us. I, I never met him, but I imagine him as being very like this. And so the, the, this cross was not something that was... You can think, you could think that it's something that is very, very brutal in a way, but it is very, made very slowly and very uh, patiently. It's something that for him took a lot of time and a lot of energy. So he only made, I think, 10 crosses during his life. And this is one of the 10. So it's a for us also, we are so happy that he is now in uh, our collection. But you can see on the spoon also that he, he made uh, drawing eyes and nose and a kind of mouth. There are others. Uh, if you look, maybe, I don't know if on the internet you can find the images of those we have. The catalog that we didn't take it now. Yeah, the only, there are only like 10 or 12 of them, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, could, I couldn't um, understand his name when you pronounce it. It's, his last name, you'll love this, is spelled G O D A R T. Um, so <laughs> so <laughs> it's, <laughs> how perfect is that? But, but I noticed that, so people have seen these two catalogs, yes? They're, and um, you know this one is the is what you see here, and it's available for purchase. And I would encourage you to buy one. And this is just for in the gallery, and it typically shows a second piece of the person's art. So I was wondering why 
For him, it was all on the same piece, so it's because you made so one. few pieces. Yeah, yeah, and we had only one in the picture, but here, for example, it's another one. Yeah. Well, if you, if you look at that one internet, you will find, if you Google him, you will find some other images of the yeah, process. Not, not so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he uses uh, uh, this pieces of wood that he found that fits in the form of the head or the, like there's another one where the, the top of the on a, on a wooden chair you have know, the thing where you put your arm on, armrest and there's a sculpted uh, thing like that and then you know, he uses this that as the head. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Intuit has found out how expensive it is to uh, have a permanent collection and what's involved in caring for it and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and you all are traveling around the world collecting. Who's paying for all this? Where's the money coming from? Um, the, 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 the museum is funded by the government, but we are an independent, uh, non governmental organization and we are still part of the structure where the studio also is part of the okay. Korean. We are part of the Korean uh, organization and uh, the funding that we have as a museum because we are officially recognized as being a museum by the Ministry of Culture mm -hmm. is not enough for no. paying everything so Korean uh, pays the rest so we really have the to find this own finance through uh, funding, we look, we search for projects, uh, and we are continuously looking and searching for funding to, okay. to, to realize what we do. But if we had to to buy all the works that are here in the collection, it would not be possible. They are mostly donations by the by the Russians themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. That and that's why. It's also so. Uh, it's not the only reason, of course, but it's one of the reasons why it's so important that we have an importance uh, for that right. community and that network of uh, of, uh, of workshops because we are really dependent on them and and how they think we are important or not. Mm -hmm. If we would just be doing a, a, a bad job and and uh, and and. The works is ne are never shown, and we never uh, give them information about anything, etc., etc., etc. They would never say, "Oh yes, we want this artist to be in your collection, so we can donate right. to you." Mm. And we also, we are for many of them, we are also doing a job that they know they can't. I mean, um, a lot of uh, uh, workshops are very aware of the limits of their archival uh, capacity and, and, the, and in the future how the work that is produced now will be, uh, will be shown or archived and our collection is a kind of, uh, of, of uh, helps them to, to fill that uh, need. And the other two, I mean, So also recognition that goes with being yeah, shown. Yeah, yeah. The recognition by the studio, but I would also say there is, is probably the recognition that your museum is at such an echelon that that a private collector might also think, I, I want a permanent home for this piece and I'm going to make a donation yeah. as well. So it you know that becomes it feeds on itself as mm -hmm. as the sort of the <coughs> fame of the collection grows as well. Yeah. And that's into its collection. Mm -hmm. has all been donated and it's a lot of people that really do want to see mm -hmm. their collections or certain specific pieces be part of the uh, yeah. collection of we this have, institution. We have rarely donated, we don't have donations from private collectors that donate for mm -hmm. you do, you do one or two. Why? Yes. It's not in our culture, not yet, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that is a historical right. mm -hmm. cultural but point. But I mean, you wouldn't say, say, no, we don't want this. Don't no. discourage her. <laughs> <laughs> no, we wouldn't say no, but it's, it's um, 
just something that we, we have to work on to do yeah, and that we don't have in our uh, work yet and it can change with it. Uh, maybe so just yes, go... Just, just once, yes. Arenach, mm -hmm. another outside museum in Brussels, accept a big donation. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, oh, uh, 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 okay. yeah. Do you know some pieces? 2,500 pieces. Okay. Yeah. Why not? I just... We, because uh, we haven't talked about it. the other is part of the exhibition yet, I, and I want to, for the time, just not to go too long, uh, to go to the next one. Okay. So, <laughs> So when we were working on the exhibition of our collection there, we, and we and I came here in February last year to prepare it. I saw this second place space where the collection of Intuit was uh, displayed. Um, and we proposed to do an exhibition in parallel with our collection but using Intuit's collection. So, it, will, it is kind of a mix between works that have a real link with what we are doing, works that I just really found uh, amazing and that I really want to, to have here on display, and also works that have um, a real uh, link with works in the collection. And the, to give an example, this is... Um, uh, Judith Scott, and she um, she's also working in Creative Growth. Not anymore. No, but she did. She worked in Creative Growth, but also that when uh, Tony Maria and Creative Growth came to uh, to my museum and they saw the work of Pascal Tassini, this working with textile and uh, knotting things and putting making sculpture out of text uh, that is uh, nothing, yeah? uh, it reminded uh, him, of course, of Judith Scott's work and there was this, uh, he, he was very surprised and almost uh, emotional uh, of knowing that uh, she, she died and then uh, he saw Pascal Tassini that he said, well, it's, I really almost recognize her in him and in the way he's the grumpy, but also very funny, and kind of, and is how how he uh, how he deals with his own work and etc. So uh, I'm really happy that, that uh, you had Judith Scott in the collection. We don't. <laughs> um, as we will, as I explained when I was there, uh, what we had in the museum with. Uh, uh, tribute to uh, Wesley. Um, Lee Goldie was um, also on, uh, in an exhibition in Mad Museum in the, for, for the photography Biennale two years ago when uh, we did a show uh, with the self portraits of Lee Goldie in the, that she made in, in the photo booths. So she's, she, was, she would go to photo booths to make a photography of herself, um, but like she's uh, showing herself like a, a French impressionist or like a very wealthy <laughs> artist with dollar bills in her hand. And very, very uh, funny and, and, and almost tongue-in-cheek uh, uh, imagery about herself, but also very, uh, I don't know how Emotional in a way that it's so vulnerable. It's, you see this woman, uh, a street lady, a street really lady, uh, and taking off her clothes like this, and, and it's almost like a, a Christian uh, imagery of someone that is that is um, martyr. 
a saint or a martyr. Yes, and it's, it was, um, I was really, uh, really touched by her work and I'm really happy that through Karl Hammer Gallery we had the loans to, to show that uh, in Belgium. And also Cindy Sherman, the uh, artist, the contemporary New York artist, she had, she has one of these photographs in her collection and uh, did a loan for, for the show. And I found it was also a very nice uh, thought that uh, Cindy Sherman's self-portraits are in, uh, that the legal self-portraits are in Cindy Sherman's collection. Which uh, is a nice. Uh, yeah. Well, and there's the persona, yes. adapting this persona and doing these uh, photographic self portraits mm -hmm. that they both um, yes, share. Right. And, and uh, Lisa Stone, who's a um, colleague of mine at school, but also been intimately involved here, she's uh, put together this uh, Darver room, for instance, back here. And she knew Ligoti and, and uh, worked with Carl Hammer when, when she was alive still. And, and she says those pictures of her showing the money and dressed up as this elegant society woman were ways that she could show the police that she wasn't a vagrant. Look, I have money. And she had these fanned out $20 bills that she'd be holding to say, I'm no vagrant. I have money. So these were like her proof of her social worth, uh, even though she lived in very um, desperate circumstances. So that, that's uh, also a link that I, I wanted to bring in, in the, but for some other works it's also just because I think that the imagery used or the, the, the way of, the, the kind of work it is would also, I, I don't know about the background of these artists for instance, uh, Barry Simons, but I, but I, I, I recognize some parts of it that could have been of Alessandro Michelangelo that we have in the collection of that, that this horse, uh, hmm. there's an artist in Priam Brussels that have very similar work in, in terms of, of, of the images that she uses. And so I think this is uh, uh, close to, to, the, to a lot of artists that we, we have in the collection. And then to uh, finish maybe it's that uh, that group of small drawings of Terry Sakoyan, um, they really touched me. I, I, um, when I saw that, I made the selection by, with files that were sent to me uh, by computer. But I, when I saw this, I was like, what is this? It's, uh, it's so uh, naive in, in their expressions, but they all have something very... Um, uh, I'm sad, um, and sometimes with children and mother and children in very archaic uh, uh, subjects. Um, and then I wrote about her uh, biography, and in fact she's uh, Armenian, mm -hmm. uh, and, f and her family was murdered du during the Armenian genocide in 1913, when uh, Turkey did a, a big uh, genocide in, uh, in uh, Armenia, which they still don't want us to talk about. Um, and she fled and went by foot as a kid along to Greece. And on a road map, it's not that far, but I can imagine to do it by foot if it's quite a distance. And then the German Red Cross. Uh, took her with them to Germany, and from Germany she was uh, adopted in a foster uh, home uh, here with her parents then in Chicago. And it's only much later, when she was uh, much older, that she made these drawings. And you, this whole uh, traumatizing uh, period of the history in Europe, uh, you, all, you, you, you feel it in her personal you see, you can read it in her personal life, but you can also, I think, feel it in a very personal, day-to-day, um, -day, uh, very tangible uh, emotion that, that comes out of these drawings. Yes. Well, and it's an emotion that, that you know, it's working, you know, I think, psychologically at a couple levels, because it's, you're trying to capture all that you lost. Mm -hmm. It comes from a period that 
was so traumatic, it's indelible in your, in your memory. Um, and then it, older people reminisce about earlier times in their lives. So it's, you know, it's part reminiscence, it's part trauma, and it's part trying to sort of reclaim what is lost. And um, it gives you, you know, you read that poignancy before you even know the biographies, mm -hmm. um, which is really um, an interesting dimension. And, and you know, we talked earlier about the um, idea of, of your collection. You know, how much uh, you know, a large percentage. You guess, estimate ninety-five percent of people uh, who work in studios. Um, and I don't know what you knew necessarily about the origins of most of this work, but I'm kind of looking around and I'm thinking the biggest bulk are people who are not mm -hmm. from studios. Well, no. uh, in the this ones that I knew, like. Uh, and Dan Miller. Dan Miller, yeah. yeah. But he's the only one on that whole wall. Yeah, we, only, we also have Dan Miller in our collection. Mm -hmm. so I that. But no, there, I didn't want to make a selection with that criterion yeah. of only seven images of the ones that are working in the, in the studio. I, I wanted just to follow our, also just my own personal sensibility. So I don't know if you have any questions about other artists in this part or in the other part of the exhibition or about how we were just uh, shoot. I also want to say that uh, in next year, is it next year or is it this year? I'm confused with the, let's say it's a jet lag. <laughs> that uh, Matt uh, Irene do, do uh, this year. This year. Two months. Huh? It's only two months. <laughs> From, uh, I'm coming here in Oh, but the, we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> Are you I'm saying I'm the show he's doing it at the uh, Yes, he's uh, doing a, a, a show of the collection of our museum in uh, in Liege. Yeah. Because that's something we do a lot is to the same room. Okay. Run the same paper. <laughs> I'm sorry for being that's okay. so stupid. <laughs> okay, I think you're just for a second. <laughs> Uh, we often invite uh, curators from other uh, museums or other places to uh, to do a selection in our collection. So he'll do the reverse of what you've done here. He'll go into yes, your archives yes, yes. and create in your house uh, yeah. a collection with new eyes. Okay, and then you get it. Yeah.